So, my name is David Forster, and this talk is Introduction to Soil Minerals. And um, to just to warn anyone who was here last year, uh, I'm basically doing the exact same talk I did last year on the exact same subject. Uh, there seems to be enough confusion around it that it's good to hear it a few times. Um, I'm not an exception to that. It took me a long time to hear the same thing over and over to learn it. So, uh, to warn you though, if you thought you got everything out of it last year, you, you may want to try a different one. Um, I have a little more time this year, so I'll cover things in a little more depth than I did last year. Basically, my, my goal with this is to sort of give you a foundation for understanding uh, the soil system and what we at the BFA talk about and what really is at the, the one way of looking at what is at the root of what basically every one of the other speakers here is talking about, what's going on in the soil. And I look at the soil minerals because it's very concrete. <coughs> it's something I can start with. Um, I'm going to leave a lot of space at the end of this talk, a lot of time for questions, Q&A. Um, some of the other speakers here at the conference, I think, have uh, brought up some issues that uh, may make you think that I'm perhaps crazy to focus on this, and I want to leave time to, to have those discussions, because I think that there are nuances to all this. Uh, they are very important. Soil minerals are, are very important, um, but they are not uh, the most important thing. But they are a good place for people who are just starting to start looking at. So um, with that introduction, I'll get started. So. Uh, like I said, I'm David Forster. I am the BFA agronomist, staff agronomist. I also have my own uh, consulting company. I consult with private clients doing soil and farm consulting. And what I always focus on is looking at the soil and I look at what are the limiting factors to soil health. And so that's where I start every conversation and everything when I'm talking to farmers. What are the limiting factors? to get the results that you want. And so that's another key point here is that it depends on what you're trying to accomplish uh, and that sets sort of the framework for how to think about this stuff. Uh, the other goal with this talk is to demystify the entire thought process around this. If you go out and start reading books on this, you will likely get overwhelmed. I mean, raise your hand if you've been overwhelmed, if you've been reading about this stuff. <laughs> um, it's very, really easy to get overwhelmed. And one of the main reasons is because um, we're dealing with living systems. They're complex. Uh, and there is more, in those books that you've read, more of it is dedicated to the sort of nuances, the what-ifs, the things that, you're, frankly, most people aren't ever going to deal with. The actual fundamental baseline of this is, is not that complicated. It only gets complicated when you start adding on all the, well, what if you have this? What if you have too much magnesium? What if you have all these little things that, in reality, if you're farming a piece of ground, you probably only have to deal with a couple of your personal what ifs. So I'm going to try to point out how to think about it so that you can get quickly to what you need to worry about and stop worrying about all the other stuff that you only need to worry about if you want to do what I do. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the other thing I want to do here is, before I forget to do this, before I lose uh, track of time, talk about some of the resources you have available when we leave here. So, bioenergy.org, the website, we have a lot of information there, in the grower section especially. Uh, we're reorganizing it and trying to do a better job of uh, presenting it. Um, these part, my presentation and uh, all the presentations here at the conference, with maybe one or two exceptions, uh, will be made available to everyone on the website. Um, and that's really, going to be a really good resource. We also have our conference recording from past years. We have uh, You can download the audio from every one of them, I believe. Uh, and there will be video for the ones that we successfully have managed to video this year as well. So that's a good place to go. Uh, I do free agronomy consulting calls once a month, roughly. And um, if you go to this website, tiny.cc slash soil health, that's the miniaturized version of the link. And you can learn about how to get connected with that there. And that is free as in, like, actually free as in free, as in you know, free beer. 
Um, <laughs> you don't have to be a member of the BFA. You can tell your friends, tell anyone who might be interested in learning how to grow better food or, you know, grow better anything, really. Um, so that's a great one. If you're the only one who calls in, it's an hour of one-on-one -on -one free consulting time. So um, I encourage people to call in. The uh, next one is December 12th, uh, Tuesday, December 12th. Uh, so it's coming up soon. Um, I also do, through the BFA, discounted one-on-one -on -one group consulting. Um, for anyone who wants that, the one-on-one -on -one is generally to help people interpret their soil test results and get them started. And then group consulting, I would love to do more of, and that would be uh, if you have a local horticulture group or a local BFA chapter, something like that, I could come and give a talk. Um, and then we also have local chapters throughout the country. They keep popping up uh, more and more. If you want, if anyone here wants to start one, get in touch with us. We have a mineral depot system. We buy in bulk many of the minerals that you might need, and um, and the biology and some of the other products that are hard to find. And if we make them available to chapters um, as best we can, and that's a really good way to get things that are hard to find. Uh, all right, I start with this picture. If you were here last year, you've seen this picture. Uh, this is in uh, Minnesota, and it's one of the flattest places on Earth. There's, I think, two inches of elevation change in five miles. It's the bottom of an ancient seabed. Um, and places in this valley are uh, extremely salty, as in sodium salt. And things grow really well when you have everything working well. But um, I'll talk about this a little more later, but I just wanted to mention now that when the group that I was working with started in this field, about 20 to 25 percent of this field had nothing growing on it. So it looked like these areas here, totally bare, uh, 20 to 25 percent around the perimeter of all these fields looked like that. Not even, weeds wouldn't even grow. It's not that they were spraying ground up there, just weeds would not grow. And not only did weeds not grow, but the soil wasn't this sort of darkish gray color, it was white. It looked like it had just snowed in the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how, because of all the salt, the sodium that was in that field. And um, this picture was taken just about, I think it was about three years uh, after that, after that point where it was 20% salt. And all but just this little part around the outside edge uh, was planted. Uh, it no longer looks white, and they were actually growing really, really healthy sunflowers there. I mean, it's still a modern crop cultivation system, but uh, they were actually building organic matter in the soil. And uh, it wasn't organic, but uh, practically might as well have been. Uh, they were not certified, but following almost entirely organic practices there. And so, in a very short period of time, they took soil that literally wouldn't grow anything, and they turned it around to grow healthy plants. And they did that with a combination of minerals and biology. Um, people around there tried it with just biology. People around there tried it with just minerals. And it doesn't work, or it takes a lot longer. So um, when you work together and figure out what the limiting factors are in your system, you can have some tremendous results. So I'll come back to exactly how this was done when we're talking about soil test results and working with your soil system. So, I want to start sort of laying this foundation with a discussion of what is soil fertility. And soil fertility is the harmonious interaction of a number of components of soil. So they're air, water, the physical, chemical, so it's minerals, it's biology. They all have to work together to create healthy living soils. If you're missing any one piece of that, then you don't really have healthy living soils. You have um, dirt, basically, or um, or something that's not working at its maximum potential. And so, if you don't have these things, if you don't have clay, silt, sand, water, air, minerals, biology, you cannot build soil, you cannot uh, grow healthy plants. You may be able to grow plants that look healthy, but they're going to be limited or they're going to be um, expensive in the sense that you have to continuously dump something on there to keep them alive and growing and happy. Um, and this picture here, this is just a, a, a sort of standard uh, chart of the physical composition of soil in terms of clay, uh, silt, sand, and various compositions of type, various uh, categories of, of loam in the middle. 
And so the key thing about fertile, healthy, living soils is they are compounded. When you have healthy soil, pretty much by definition, you're creating more of it. Um, the, the Great Plains uh, had in some places many dozens of feet of soil that were built over many millions of years. And that was done through the uh, healthy symbiotic relationships between the various components of soil, the biology, the minerals, the air, the water, the plants, etc. And as they grow, they actually produce more soil. They produce topsoil. And they do that by breaking down the rock, breaking down the parent material, incorporating organic matter, and that, that process creates what we think of as topsoil. And that topsoil is able to support life and grow abundance and continue to create more of it. And this is something that our, our industrial agricultural system has been mining this soil for a number of years. And until we can get away from that and start building soil, uh, we aren't really, it's not a sustainable model. It is just like mining in any other sense. And so what I'm really talking about here is called pedogenesis. This is the building of soil, the creation of soil. Um, and there's an equation laid up by a Russian geologist that defines how you create soil. And creating soil is a function of, of these things that are down here at the bottom. It's a function of climate, paramaterial, biological process, and time. And there's only certain ones of these that I can control. I cannot control time. It'd be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can control somewhat climate, like in terms of I can make sure that my plants have enough water. I can make sure I can do manner preferences, make sure that they have the soil has air, uh, that there's stuff happening around them, you know, the gases they need, etc. I can do that to some degree. Um, I can impact biological processes. For sure, I can bring in inoculants, I can feed microbes, I can, um, I can bring in the things that are missing and try to balance and keep them alive. Um, and then I can also do this, this parent material. So we think of soil as this sort of stand, stable thing, it's been there for a long time. We go out there, we just look at soil and assume that that dirt out there has always been there. But in many cases around here, um, one of the ways it got there is through glaciation been through geological processes. These things take millions and millions of years. And so the way I think about building soil is that what I'm trying to do is make this equation as efficient as time, or as, as efficient as possible. And the thing I can't control is this one, so I worry about these. So I always tell people if you can't maintain hydration, you can't keep your plants moist, none of these things matter. The biology's going to die, the minerals are going to sit there, doesn't matter, don't waste your money if you can't do that. So, um, and, the, and the same thing applies to any other ones. If you have biology, but you don't have uh, the hydration, if you don't have the minerals necessary to have as much diversity as you can in biology processes, as much uh, vibrancy there, then you are, to some degree, wasting some of that investment of time or money. And so, I like to look at all of them together, find where my weaknesses are, and focus on those. I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt by training. It's an industrial engineering uh, methodology. And so what I learned was always find your, um, your weakest link in the system, and that's where you want to focus. Because until you fix that one, everything else you're doing is a waste of your time. And in farming, it's very similar. If you're spending all your time um, making really awesome compost tea, but you're not making sure your plants maintain hydration or that you've got a little bit of boron there, then you might actually just be wasting your time. So uh, <coughs> try not to get stuck on in a dogmatic approach to your farming, your growing practices. Uh, I think that's one of the things that where a lot of people get tripped up. They, they hear a great idea, and it's a great idea, and they think it's a great idea for them, and then they wonder why it doesn't work, and it doesn't work probably because they've never thought of this. Um, so, um, and why is pedogenesis important? Uh, pedogenesis is important because basically if you aren't growing soil, you are likely destroying it. Um, soil is rather easy to destroy. And so if you're not making your decisions in a way that you're really consciously thinking about how can I grow more soil, make it healthier and happier, you're likely destroyed. Um, you're likely not sitting on the knife edge of in between, perfectly balanced between um, just barely 
not destroying it or not building it. So if you're not seeing new soil being created, if you're not seeing improvements in your soil over time, then you're probably engaged in mining. So keep that in mind. Um, so what I like to do when I look at accelerating pedogenesis, and that's what I want to do, I want to make this equation as efficient as possible. Uh, and what I like to do when I do that, I don't just you know, go out and try to throw chemical fertilizers or anything like that at it. What I like to do is mimic natural processes. So I try to eliminate the inefficiencies in them, what I see in my system, and mimic natural processes. If I didn't care about making money, if I didn't care about feeding my family, I could wait for the next glacier. <laughs> but I have a short lifespan, and I'd like to be a shepherd to the land that I take care of. And I'd like to teach my farmers and science that as well. And so that, to me, is really important. So if you have enough time to wait, you don't have to really worry about this. Uh, but most of us don't have those types of time scales available to us. And I would propose that what we need to be doing is helping nature out a little bit. Um, what we're doing is not necessarily counter to what nature intends. We're just um, trying to work within those systems, accelerate them for our own purposes. So um, these are the things I, I look at. I look at creating more perfect climate, um, ensuring that we have adequate and balanced minerals, so that's the parent materials, and also um, eliminating stress on biology. So that might mean um, you may not have biology, that's a thing that happens, uh, so you may have to bring it in, and then you may have to feed it and take care of it. Um, people hear uh, that's not a big shock to when I talk to conventional growers. Um, generally when they hear soil biology, um, if they've really thought about it all, they've usually thought about it in terms of um, something trying to kill their plants that they have to spray. And so it's, this is a big leap for some people. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't take much to get this. Um, for one thing, many, a lot of the soil, the pathogens in the soil, they actually have protective properties for other pathogens. And when they're balanced, uh, they actually help plants uh, grow better. So um, I'm going to blank on the example I had in mind then. That's great. But uh, we'll get back to that. So delving into the sort of nitty-gritty of what how <laughs> of soil and how soil minerals plays uh, a role in healthy soils. Uh, starting, I'll start with this chart, so, or this picture. So this is how you can think of how minerals sit into soil. So this box represents the clay portion of soil, and these minerals are some of the cation elements that are in those soils. So cations, cats generally, Think of it as positive unless you're allergic. Uh, <laughs> anions are like ants, and you know they're you know positive unless they're in your kitchen. So we, you know, ne let's call it negative. So anions are negative, cats are positive, and so these are cations, which means that they can stick to soil uh, soil colloid, the clay particles in soil, because they have an electrostatic charge where they are attracted to each other. So what what soil is made up of, what the clay component of soil, we're going to talk a lot about clay, and I'll tell you why in a second, but clay soil particles stick minerals to them, and the amount of clay you have can vary tremendously, and also how many sites can be on the clay. So this is a, this is a box, it's a certain size box, and the same size box in different types of clay can have a different number of these elements stuck to it. Uh, and that's based on the age, the weathering, the type of clay it is. Some clays just naturally hold more minerals, uh, and some clays uh, are very weathered. So in the south, uh, southeast United States, for instance, a lot of the clays are very old geologically and weathered, and they, the soil may be pure clay, practically, but they hold very little nutrients. Some of you will have heard of this, um, and we'll talk about how you address that in just a moment. Uh, but what I want to point out here, too, is that clay isn't in a box shape like this. Clay is, is, comes in sheets, so there's layers of clay, and on the outside edges of those clay, you'll have a lot of these elements. And sometimes you'll have some of those stuck between the layers of clay. And the size of these elements actually will influence how closely those clay layers are, stick to each other. And so one thing I'll talk about a little later in more detail 
is that certain things like calcium make those clay layers get further apart. Things like magnesium tend to have them stuck closer together. And when they're closer together, they can trap things inside of them, and it can change the physical properties of how the clay reacts in soil. And this is the piece where, uh, where it's important to realize that when you're adding soil minerals, you're not just adding soil minerals because you think that there's not enough in the soil. It's also about changing the physical and uh, the physical properties of that soil and how biology works within it and to create a, a more efficient system. So we'll again talk about that more in a minute. Um, changing gears slightly here, um, there is this concept that there is an ideal cation balance. Um, Dr. William Albright came up with this concept. He did a lot of research when around around the world, studying places where animals uh, and people, but mostly animals, uh, nutrition and health was higher than in other places. And he found that there was this correlation basically between the health of the animals and the soil in which their food was grown. And the and basically what he found was that anywhere in the world, and almost and then he started looking at the crops, anywhere in the world, any crops, uh, oops, button, uh, if they if it approximated this ideal cation balance, everything worked, seemed to work better. And so he spent basically the rest of his career studying this. And so that ideal cation balance is approximately 68% calcium, 12% magnesium, 4% potassium, 1% sodium, and the trace elements, the trace element cation. Now, one important thing here is that, um, going back to this, the amount of minerals that can be held onto the clay portion of the soil, remember these are cations, there's a name for that, and that's called the total exchange capacity. So it's the total capacity of your soil, of your, mostly it's clay, because the clay is tiny, it has a huge surface area, which is why so many things can stick to it. Uh, a, a very many orders of magnitude less things stick to silt, and many orders of magnitude less things stick to sand. So the clay is really where most stuff sticks, in terms of cations. And so the amount of this stuff that can stick to this size box of clay, or soil, is the total exchange capacity. That's an important thing to keep in mind because that is what relates the percent of these elements to the actual amount of pounds you need to have in your soil to have a balanced soil that works well. And um, when you have this in your soil, it leads to a pH of 6.4 every time. When you are higher or lower in some of the cations, it changes your pH. And this is also why um, <coughs> pH is a poor metric for soil health and mineral balance. It's because basically all of these things, and all of these things, impact pH. But we don't know which ones. And so, for instance, this calcium actually impacts pH less than magnesium, which is less than calcium potassium, which is less than sodium. So you may have, and, and actually this comes, goes back to the Minnesota picture, um, the pH in that soil was, I think, 8.4, so it's very basic. Uh, if you're from New England, most of you can't imagine an 8.4 pH. Uh, you're usually like 5.4, maybe 6, if you've you know, been working on it for a while. Um, but out there it was 8.4, and it was because they had super high sodium and magnesium, which has a big influence on pH. And the solution to their many of their issues, which we'll get to in a minute, was adding calcium. They literally added basically limestone, and their pH went down. This is totally count counter to the sort of accepted uh, truth about lime and pH. Normally, you have low pH, you add lime, the pH goes up. Well, that's only if uh, you need the um, if you're deficient in, in these, in these cations, if you're excessive in anything but calcium, you can actually see the pH go down when you add limestone. So there's a lot of nuances here, a lot of things that, that are like half-truths that get just sort of repeated because it's simple. And I'm going to try to explain them in, in enough detail that you understand it without further confusing you. So uh, 
Anyway, so then the one last caveat to this is that this ideal balance, this ideal cam -M balance, is subject to change a little bit based on your exchange capacity. If you have low exchange capacity, you have to modify these numbers a little bit. If you have super high, uh, you have to modify them a little bit. But by and large, that's, that's a good target. All right. And so um, these are so, uh, what these are recommended values for the elements on a soil test. Now this is a loading lap soil test, and I want you to be very clear if you're taking notes that this is based on a Logan Labs base saturation uh, test. Any other lab, any other type of soil test, you cannot use these numbers. You need to be very clear here. If you apply these numbers to other people's tests, you likely will screw things up because they don't all test the same way. Um, it is not that they test something that it's not, it's not wrong, it's not bad. It's just that this cannot apply in the same way. Um, the best thing to do is ask your lab what they recommend. Um, many labs will be happy to do so. My only issue is that many labs do not even look at half of these things. And that's a problem for me. Um, but that being said, if people out there using labs that do different methods, they get good results. Uh, I'm not saying my way is the only way or even remotely the best way. But it does work. I've done enough that I, it does work. So this is, this is on the website. This, uh, here's the link to it. tiny.cc slash mineral targets. If you don't want to scribble all of this down. It is also on your handout. Again, if any of those on a handout, uh, grab one. We're going to get to that in just a moment. On the far left side of the handout is uh, a quick, dirty version of this. All right. We're going to skip this. All right. All right. So we're going to jump into the soil, the soil tests. Um, on the sheet, on the handout, we've got three different soil tests representing some variation that I was able to pull together uh, to show some uh, interesting things to, you should be aware of and make some points. And every time I look at a soil test, um, the first thing you always want to look at is your TEC numbers. So at the toward the top, about the third line down, you've got TEC. For the vegetable garden sample, it's 10.29. And if you remember, I was mentioning that that's a really important number. That's important because it is what tells you how much nutrients your soil can hold, which then also tells you if you have to modify that, that uh, ideal cation balance that we were talking about. And so when you have a TEC above about an 8, it means you can hold, theoretically, enough nutrients in an extractable form for an entire year growing season for an annual crop, generally speaking. If you're below a TEC of 8, it will mean that organic matter becomes more important for you because you are able to hold fewer minerals on your clay um, uh, colloid. And so that's something to keep in mind. So Organic matter is always great. You always want to work on that. The best way to get good organic matter is to grow healthy crops. We'll talk about that later in terms of the uh, chicken and the egg problem of uh, growing healthy crops when you don't already have healthy soil. But um, for now, what you need to know is that if you're above 8, uh, you're pretty good. If you're above 10, you're definitely um, pretty solid in terms of being able to hold your nutrients. Um, and that gets important when we start talking about the back. But we're going to just kind of skip down here a little bit. The most important thing after TC is looking at the base saturation percent numbers, which is in the middle gray area of your soil test. And there you can see numbers on that first one, 59 and 32. And this is where you want to pay attention to the recommended base saturation percent numbers. So basically, for base saturated percent of calcium, you're looking for 60 to 68 percent. Magnesium is 12 to 20. Potassium is 3 to 6. Sodium is 0.5 to 3. And so if you look at that first one, you've got 59 percent calcium, 32 percent magnesium, 3 percent potassium, 1 percent a little bit more of sodium. So right away, and this is basically how I assess soil testing services, laboratories. Uh, if they claim to do this type of soil test, 
where they're actually interested in base uh, um, uh, base saturation cation balancing, and they don't they either don't give you the percentage, or the percentages don't make sense when you actually look at the field and you know something's up. But in this particular case, you've got low calcium and high magnesium, and what that does in soils is it makes the clay particles stick together more closely. It makes your soil um, slimy and kind of smear. If, uh, and this this is a 10.29. This particular was not high in clay necessarily, but they described it as heavy clay soil. This is one of those little triggers. Every time someone describes their soil as heavy clay soil, I say, what's your base saturation magnesium? And nine plus times out of ten, it is higher than it's supposed to be, usually by a lot. And this is one example of that being true. So the magnesium acts to actually um, stick the soil together more tightly. And what that does is it makes it act like clay, uh, or what we think of as clay. It reduces the pore, pore spaces where there's the oxygen, where there's air. It reduces the um, rate of influx of water. Um, basically, it, it causes an awful lot of, it causes compaction or it causes um, recompaction very quickly. And it causes, it actually traps minerals. So when you have high magnesium, you can actually get, potassium gets trapped in the layers of clay. And even though it may show up on your soil test, um, when your plants really need it, it may not be available to them uh, in the amount that you think you might have. So in this particular case, uh, they, this garden was exhibiting, uh, it had uh, uh, it was prone to root diseases, it had poor uh, soil soil flocculation, so like it wasn't really crumbly, like you've ever seen really nice crumbly soil. Um, that's a well flocculated soil. It, you can get that a lot easier if you have a good calcium magnesium balance. They didn't have that here. They had potassium deficiency symptoms. Far in excess of one of three might indicate normally on a soil test. Uh, and that was because the magnesium was blocking uptake of potassium. And if you read, um, I didn't mention it before, but there are several really good books I recommend on this. One is um, the Ideal Soil by Michael Aster. That's probably the easiest one to digest as a beginner. And then there's sort of the, the, the Bible for this, which would be, uh, in my mind, um, Neil Kinsey's um, uh, Neil Kinsey's book, Hands On Agronomy. And in that book, uh, he goes through a whole slew of examples of, many examples, of, of all the different interactions between these elements. So when I just met one. High magnesium ties up potassium. That's one example. Uh, another one would be high nitrogen ties up potassium. Uh, high phosphorus ties up zinc. High zinc ties up phosphorus. These are things that are in um, hands-on agronomy that uh, really are really valuable when you're trying to understand your soil system. And so when you have, when you're looking at a soil test, the first thing you want to look for is you go down through, you highlight anything that's deficient, anything that's below your target, highlight preferably a different color, anything that's excessive, so above your target. And that's where you really want to focus your effort and try to tease out what the things are that you need to work on. And so cation, uh, base saturation uh, percents, that's the, that's the first place you look. If you have a big imbalance between magnesium, uh, calcium, potassium, and sodium, that has a huge impact. The nice thing is it's one of the easiest things to fix. So say you're low in calcium and you need usually a, a high calcium limestone or uh, gypsum. If you're excessive in something like magnesium, gypsum is often best because gypsum helps to uh, break up that the bond between the magnesium and the, and the soil. Colloid is <coughs> to split that magnesium off uh, and, and replace it with the calcium. So gypsum is good when you have an excess of something other than calcium. Um, and so those are the first places to look there. The other thing um, at the far right side is this test called Salem. And this is something that most people in, in New England, I don't think, have seen, where you have excessive calcium. I've seen it sometimes when people are adding compost that they add a lot of eggshells to, they add a lot of limestone to. And in that particular case, you can also have the same kind of problem you have, uh, you decrease potassium availability. So you need to try to get it within the targets. You try to um, um, try to uh, address the 
deficiencies by adding things. And then with the excesses, that's a little bit trickier. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But I want to get to the, back to the, the top of the sheet and just going to run through how I do it uh, when I'm looking at these. So you've identified your, your deficiencies. You've looked at your excesses. So looking at sulfur, this is one that is almost always deficient, unless you've been adding lots of sulfur for many years or you live in someplace uh, that has sulfur mines, which is, as far as I don't know, we're east of the Mississippi River. Um, so this one's 14 parts per million sulfur. The target is 75 parts per million sulfur. And so here we go to some math, and I forgot to warn people there would be a little bit of math. Um, so you take 75, you are in, well, let me back up. When you're really low, you don't want to do everything at once. That's an important thing that I haven't mentioned. Um, oftentimes, so the, 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 a lot of the arguments against using minerals is that they kill soil life, but they can actually negatively impact your biology. And to, to some degree, that's definitely true. Everything you do, every step you take in a field, every element you add, does kill soil life. But it also creates conditions where other life can live and potentially increase the diversity and how healthy that life is. So in the case of sulfur, if you're like at 14 in this case, or 20, I like to target 50 parts per million. That's the beginning of good. 75 would be considered sort of excellent. So if you target 50, you take the 14 parts per million, you subtract, or take 50, you subtract 14, so you need 36 parts per million sulfur. And to get to, from part per million to pounds per acre, you multiply by 2. So you have 36, you multiply that by 2, you have 72. And then you have to divide that by the amount of sulfur in the material you're at. And here's another point where people get very confused. Can I do 36 again? Yeah. For, uh, 50, I think that's 50 minus 14. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't hear. I, so the fifth, sorry, yes, the fifth, I, yes, that's because I wrote 75 and I didn't write 50. 50 is the minimum target. 75 is the ideal target. It is not on there because I screwed up. Um, is the minimum target like for good and 75 is ideal. Um, and so then once you get, once you figure that out, you're taking your, your, your target, you subtract what you have. So 50 minus 14, uh, you get 36. You multiply it by 2 to get pounds per acre. So you get uh, 72. And then you divide that by in, in 0.9 or whatever the um, composition of the material you have is. So if you're using elemental sulfur, which is my preferred method of adding sulfur, and I'll tell you why in a minute, it's 90% sulfur. So 90%, 0.9. So you take the uh, 72 that you got before and you divide it by 0.9 and you get, let me write this down, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80-ish pounds of elemental sulfur. So you need to add 80 pounds elemental sulfur to get you from 14 to 50. And that's in a perfect world. We do not live in one of those. So you'll add that and you will not get to 50. You will get to something else. Usually with sulfur, there is such a need for it in the systems that you will put 50 down, or you'll put you know 80 pounds down, should be enough to get to 50, but you won't get there. You'll come up somewhere short. Um, don't fret about that. The sulfur didn't just go away. What it probably did is went to fixing some other aspect of your soil system. So when you have an excess, like an excess of magnesium, like in the soil, um, some of that sulfur is going to go to fixing the excess. So when you, add, when you have an excess of a cation, sulfur helps to get rid of that excess. It helps to strip that element off the soil colloid and make it and flush it out of the system, making space for other things. So a lot of that sulfur is going to go to that. And so I would always I would round up to about 100 pounds of sulfur on this instead of the 80. And that will give you a little bit more. But honestly, it's going to, this soil will take probably three years of adding that to get enough sulfur. Um, can you say again why, why it goes down? Why the sulfur doesn't go where you think it's going to? Yeah. yeah. So there's basically a big sulfur sink in your soil. It's going into the, it's going to attach itself to the magnesium that's excessive to help remove it from the system. Because in reality, these, the ideal soil balance isn't just ideal because we think it works the best. It actually 
the soil almost seems to want to approach that balance on its own. So when we actually have the sulfur, the soil system is not necessarily intelligent, but it uh, certainly acts that way. It'll, the sulfur will attach to the most excessive cation, and it will remove it from the soil, the, the clay, which will make the space you need for the things that are deficient. So it'll make the space you need for the calcium or the potassium or whatever. And the magnesium will flush out through the soil, and, um, and you'll lose it that way, basically. It'll still be there, available to plants as a, as a fertilizer element, and sulfur is extremely vital to plant health and human health, uh, but you won't show up on the soil test until you've addressed, until it has basically worked on all of those excesses. So it, um, it's one of those things that trips. I get a lot, so many calls about sulfur, it's crazy. Um, the other piece about sulfur is, people don't, don't understand this, but um, sulfate, it's not the same as sulfur. Sulfate is an oxidized sulfur, and when it is in sulfate form, it is a water-soluble form of sulfur, and it does not act the same. It will quickly leach out of your system. It doesn't really build sulfur on your soil test. It'll help feed a crop sulfur, um, and but it will not stick around. Sulfur, to be transferred from sulfur to a plant-available water-soluble form, takes something like 56 biological sort of steps and processes, biochemical steps, and so each one of those, there's things in the soil that will grab a hold of it. There's bacteria that will chelate it, which means bind it up into organic compounds, and it will help to keep it around a lot longer. So a lot of people are like, I don't want to use elemental sulfur. It's super acidic. It kills microbes. Sure, yeah, it does. Every microbe within maybe a quarter inch of each little pellet is probably going to be dead. But when you actually spray out 100 pounds of sulfur over an acre of ground, and we're, I, I do everything by the acre. It's how my mind works. But... When you do that, you put 100 pounds per acre, the pellets are about maybe this far apart, and they're only going to impact the biology in that little quarter inch around it. You've got six inches or more of soil below it. So you're killing, yes, you're killing microbes, but you're killing microbes on a tiny fraction of your total soil, and you're adding the things that are holding back your system from functioning better. The things that are holding your system back from more efficiently building soil, uh, in a lot of cases, sulfur is one of the top ones. Um, and until you can address it, you're not working as efficiently as you can. So can I ask you another question? Sure, certainly. Uh, all right, so this first quick one is uh, 72 times 0.9, you're saying 80, why is it 80? 72 divided by 29. Yeah. And um, is there a chart that shows kind of like standard, uh, let's say, like elemental sulfur, it's 90% sulfur? How yeah. Like other things like gypsum. Is there, is there, um, there, there are online. I can quickly, I can also, I can give a list. Maybe remind me at the end, and I, if we still have time, I'll give you a list verbally, and they are available. You can Google them. It's, it's a good way to um, search online. Also keep in mind that every material you might buy may be a different number. So always check the bag or the source of what you're using. You can get into a lot of trouble doing that with trace elements, especially if you're assuming it's 5%, but it's actually 39%. That's a molybdenum example, for instance. Um, so you always check the bag you're using. Is there one more, another question back there? Yeah, can you explain the why, as far as these targets go, that it only works for local lab versus... Yes, thanks for bringing that up. And um, So local lab does a very specific test, basically. What they're looking at when they give you a base set, um, base plus test, um, is that they're looking for extractable minerals. They're not looking for water soluble, and they're not looking at total elemental. So a total elemental will be like what, everything that's in your soil, like a geological assessment, every element. Um, a water soluble is what it sounds like. It's the water soluble nutrients and solution um, that you can get out of your soil. Their test is an extractable, so it, it assumes that you have some biology, it assumes you have uh, a system that's working together. Uh, they use different acids, basically, to break some things apart. So it's a, the number will be higher than water-soluble, but less than the, the total elemental. <laughs> and every lab does that test a little differently. And the reason you can't apply the same numbers is because um, many labs over the years have to cut costs and save time, etc., have changed how they do that. Um, many of the labs don't necessarily know 
how to use these numbers the way that I'm trying to teach people to use them. Um, and so that they have made the, they've, they've changed how they do it and the numbers don't work out the same anymore. And that's why I also say it's not that this is the right way, this is the way I know how to make it work. And, um, and I guarantee you the numbers that you get on a load and lab test are wrong in the sense that your plant doesn't necessarily see exactly these numbers. But that's not really the point, because the point is that when, you, when these numbers are approximately where they're supposed to be, the whole system actually does work better. And it works better because of the, how calcium and magnesium work together to change the structure, the physical structure, the amount of air and water in your soil. Um, the relative amounts of some of these things are really important to uh, which species of microbes are living or not in your soil. And so that's why there's these general recommendations. They're not hard and fast rules. I don't want anyone to leave here thinking that they need to like farm to a soil test. It's a good way to throw money away. Um, but they are a good place to start. And so if you have major imbalances, like what some of these are on the soil test, those major imbalances are going to point you in a direction that's going to be helpful for you to make decisions. Um, Sometimes you'll see something that's out of whack in your soil test, but you won't actually do anything about it. There's, you know, I have high phosphorus here. All right, so the biggest thing you want to look for when you have high phosphorus is where's my zinc? Because those are the, that's a really tightly correlated um, nutrient system there. So when you have high phosphorus, it ties up zinc, and when you have high zinc, it ties up phosphorus. So when you have high phosphorus, you want to make sure you also have. Um, towards the higher end of zinc. So if you look at, look down there, zinc, the recommendation is eight plus. And it's eight plus because when phosphorus is much higher than it's supposed to be, as it is in this case, you actually need to <coughs> double or maybe even a little more your level of zinc to make sure that you can maintain zinc availability. Um, and so that's, like, that's how this works and why when you cut the corners and you make it a little cheaper, you make, or you just change it because you think it's a better way of doing a soil test, it no longer, the ratios no longer work, the relationships no longer work. Um, so that's a key point there. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, are, are you familiar with working with any other lab reports like CSI? Or, or? So, not particularly. I've seen many of them. Um, I've worked with some of them. I've talked to some of the people there. I mean, I mean there are good consultants and agronomists getting results with a lot of different soil labs. And so, I'm just teaching you what you can do on your own. So one reason we like Logan is it's not very, not very expensive, and you don't have to work with a consultant to use it. So you can take several tests yourself, send them there, and get your results. And then we try to teach you how to interpret them yourself. Um, many other labs, you have to actually work with a consultant in order to even access the lab. Um, so we're trying, to, we're trying to basically give you the tools to do it yourself. Um, and so that's a big reason why we've done that. Yeah. Um, so I, I have an issue when I'm doing calculations on soil test because I'm working with a lot of very small spaces. They're not acres. Right. They're um, you know hundreds of square feet. Right. And I get really bottlenecked up in terms of where the decimal point is yeah. going when I'm looking at stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> so I'll just tell. You, so when I look at it, I think in terms of pounds in acres. Uh -huh. um, the, a lot of the, I like to start with acres, even if I'm doing a thousand square feet. I start, I make all the recommendations in, in terms of acres, and I divide by 43, and that gets you thousand per thousand square feet. And if you need to go smaller than that, it's pretty easy to just lock off a decimal point or and uh, to get a hundred square feet. So that's how I do it. Do it in acres, divide by 43 to get thousand square feet, and that is usually where people like to like to end up. And then when you start really keep dividing it, you're starting to talk about tiny amounts. And we can talk about that later if we have time, about how you actually apply a half an ounce of something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, how, how would you go about correcting this um, phosphorus? In yeah. So high? Yeah. So um, the first thing I want to point out on phosphorus is that you may notice that the numbers are different between these two recommendations. Um, and this is really another important point that I, I kind of left it confusing like this for a reason, is to draw your attention to it or remind you of this. These are in parts per million. If you look at this sheet, 
you'll see that it's in Pals Breaker. It's my one biggest pet peeve with Logan Labs is that sometimes you get your results in parts per million and sometimes you get them in Pals Breaker. And if you don't notice that, you can kind of screw up your math a little bit. So just I want to point that out. It's a good opportunity to do that. This particular one, your phosphorus on here, is in pounds per acre. So that's why there's the discrepancy. Um, what that means, in reality, is that while it says you have 2,427 on here, it's actually 1,213 or 14, um, based on parts per million. But it's still high, obviously. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, phosphorus is often high. It's often low. It's, there's a huge range in available phosphorus. Um, I constantly see people who've added a ton of compost over the years who have astronomically high phosphorus levels. And there's not anything in, like specific you can do to address that. It's not necessarily even a problem if you can bring everything else up to an ideal level. If you've got good phosphorus, that's actually an expensive thing to fix when you're deficient. So count yourself, it's somewhat of a blessing, but you do have to keep it in mind and work extra hard to bring everything else up because um, if you have high phosphorus and you're deficient in other things, that makes the high phosphorus worse, does that, does, if that makes sense. The other thing is sometimes um, the phosphorus is a good example. You can have other things that will tie it up. So phosphorus and calcium uh, tend to... Um, get along so well that they don't like to ever split apart again. And so when you have high phosphorus, adding adding calcium, sometimes you'll add a lot of calcium, you think you're going to get your calcium where it needs to be, and it just won't show up, but slowly your phosphorus will come down. And that's because phosphorus and calcium like to tie up in a mineral called it's an appetite, appetite rock. It, it basically turns back into a hard rock, and both of them become unavailable. So one approach if you've got super high phosphorus is to add um, keep your calcium high, keep your calcium available, and it will slowly tie up some of that phosphorus. So that's one way to do that. But again, really just making sure when you have an excess in, in phosphorus, or in, in many other ones, bring everything else up to the target. That's the first thing to focus on. Um, so hopefully that helps to answer that question. Um, on your sheet, yeah. you have 150 phosphorus, up there you have 75. Right, and that's the whole, that's what I was talking about a moment ago with, that's in parts per million, and this oh, one is in pounds per acre. So the 150 on here that's, over in that column? Right, that's pounds per acre. And then, so that's the important consideration that, uh, first of all, the, the math to go from one to the other is you can multiply your parts per million times two, and that gets you pounds per acre. That's because they assume that an acre of soil, the top six inches of an acre of soil weighs two million pounds. So if you want to like to do math and make sure that these numbers make sense, that's where it comes from. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the phosphorus in the load lab is known as P2O5, so does that include the weight of the oxygen? Exactly, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. So um, when, when agronomists, farmers, uh, fertilizer salespeople talk about phosphorus, they're usually basically always actually talking about phosphate. Phosphate is what um, they're actually measuring, what they're actually concerned about. So it's not actually elemental phosphorus that they're looking at, but it's phosphate. Um, and it's you'll see that also when you start talking to people about potassium, they often say potash. Potash would be, um, it's not actually potassium itself. So that, that's something to keep in mind. The definitions in terms of an agriculture versus actual chemistry, if there's chemists in the room, if there's chemists who become farmers, they're constantly going to be frustrated by the fact that agriculture doesn't use the real, the right words in quite a few examples. So that's one of them, phosphorus versus phosphate. So, um, yeah. Um, all right. But the, so the 75 ppm is, is for phosphate. It's, it's for phosphate. And even though many labs will report it as phosphorus, I don't know if any of them are measuring it as anything other than phosphate. Um, all right, so let's see, where do we want to go next? Um, all right, there's so, there's so many nuances. So this is another thing I want, I want to mention. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of times when what people get messed up and why they really can't understand soil test results, why they get frustrated that it doesn't make any sense, is when they do something and then it doesn't 
behave like they expect it to. And often that's because there's the uh, interrelationships between these elements is what screws them up. So in the case of, this is a good example, I've, a lot of people have this problem. They have low potassium uh, and maybe they have uh, high magnesium like this first example. Their pH is above 7. And when your pH is above 7, things don't exactly work the same as if they're lower than 7. So one of the things that happens is that soil, when it has, when the pH is above 7, there's not much room on that, on that box the soil box we look here. It's full. In fact, not only is it full, but it's kind of got extra stuff floating around that's not really attached, but it sort of is attached. And so there's no room there. So if you want to add something like calcium, the calcium is just going to like come in here and be like, well, that, that, there's no place for me to go. Um, and that's why what I was mentioning before sulfur is important. The sulfur helps to, like say in, this, in our example on this sheet, helps to cut this bond with the <coughs> making room for <coughs> calcium. And the same thing happens with potassium. So if you in this soil, your pH is above 7, um, there's no room to add potassium to this. And so until you can get calcium and sulfur and to start splitting off your excesses, you're wasting money if you add any more potassium, basically, than what your plants need that year. So in this particular example, you um, there's a deficit, if you look in the exchangeable cations potassium row, the deficit is 75 pounds per acre of potassium. Uh, and that's how much you need to bring your soil test result to 4%. But there's no room for 75 pounds of potassium on here. And so what you would want to do is actually um, trickle feed your crop to make sure the crop has enough potassium until you can fix your imbalances here, get rid of the excess magnesium, make space here for the potassium. Otherwise, you're literally just throwing money away because the potassium is going to go... It's going to like float up here. It's going to be like, ah, it's full. I'm going to go over here. And it's going to go downstream into rivers. It's going to um, not, not stick to your soil pollen. Um, furthermore, and this is where we get start to talk about what Elaine, you know, I think, told a lot of you, is that it's ridiculous to add minerals because there's tons already there. And potassium is a great example. There's 40,000 pounds of potassium on average in every acre of topsoil, and that's just actually the top six inches of topsoil, 40,000 pounds. And so it's a little bit ludicrous that we ever think to add potassium ever, because there's tons there. Um, but having it there and having it available to plants are incredibly different things. And it is true that biology will make things available if you have excellent, excellent biology. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's really hard to have good biology if you don't have good plants, because then what's feeding the biology? And it's really hard to have good plants if you don't have any potassium. So that's why when I say on an example like this, we have borderline deficient potassium, your magnesium is really high, so it's going to block the availability of some of that potassium. If you're not adding some potassium to that, you're going to have a really hard time to keep plants healthy enough to be putting carbon into the soil and feeding the microbes that are then going to unlock more potassium for you. So by adding a little bit, you can potentially unlock a lot. And so that's a key part of all of this to keep in mind, like I said earlier, we're not trying to get a perfect soil test. We're trying to build soil. And one of the ways to do that is to make the soil test a little better, try to tweak it as best we can so that we can unlock the conditions for the biology to do the rest of the work for us. Um, so that's I want to make that point. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about trace elements before I open up for questions. Um, Trace elements are something that people get stuck on. They can be very difficult to understand like how to get the materials out there. Um, we're dealing with tiny amounts uh, in general. And um, but a couple there's a couple things that are pretty universal. Um, unless you're from the Rocky Mountains or Point West, you are unlikely to have enough boron in your soil. It's just a fact of geology. Um, if you have really, really, really good biology, you're going to find maybe be able to get enough for healthy plant growth. But to add the maximum yearly application of boron costs seven dollars an acre. Uh, boron is extremely important for moving elements up and down in plants. And when plants can't move elements up and down, it means that they run out of things when they're growing quickly, which is invites disease, which limits photosynthetic efficiency 
and limits the amount of carbon that they're able to put in the soil to feed the microbes in the soil. And so if you don't address these things, when you have a deficiency in boron, and you're just going to assume it's in your soil and hope for the best, you're not going to get the best. <laughs> you're never going to get the best. Um, and so while you may not have to get boron all the way to two or three parts per million to be the target, I would argue that your you're not well served to not add any, and um, and anyway. So yeah, I just want to, you should add some boron if you're deficient in boron. Like hands down, I'll make that categorical statement. Um, you may not need to add all of it, it's but cheap. And it, yeah, it's cheap. Um, so to understand how much boron you can add, um, every one of these things has a maximum yearly application rate. Every element. Um, boron is low, so you can only have two pounds of actual boron per acre. And if you're using a 10% boron, that would come to 20 pounds of product. If you're using a 20% boron, it's 10 pounds of product per acre. So you're talking small amounts. Those small amounts make a tremendous impact, which is also crazy when you think about it because 10 pounds spread over an acre is not very much stuff. Um, but that's how you look at that. Um, I don't. We'll see if we get time to go over the element of where you get these things, but um, that's what you need to do. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, spread 10 pounds over an acre. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, the easiest way is to have it blended in with other things. Right, but if you don't need to add anything else, then um, that. Exactly, right. So whether you need to or whether you're just going to blend it into something that isn't going to, be, isn't going to hurt you or might be beneficial for other reasons, so compost is a great one. You can add it to compost, you can add it to um, uh, leaf mulch. There's lots of ways of doing it. Um, it's water. rare. What? Can you dilute it You can, water? yeah. So that's the other one. You can, you can dilute it in water, you can dissolve it, you can spray it on. Um, I generally, my recommendations are to use granular whenever possible. So by my, well, my way of working, it's a lot easier. You can mix it with other granulars, you can spread them out easily. The granular stuff generally is a slower release, so you're less risk of burning plants. Uh, when you use water-soluble things, you, you, you really need to cut the rate of application. So I said two pounds of boron per acre per year. But if you're using soluble and you put all two pounds at once, you're liable to burn things. Like borax. Right. Borax, yeah. borax is one of those things that's not as soluble as soluble, but it's soluble enough. Right. And um, if you applied it all at once, so if you applied all 15 pounds or so of borax at once, then you could burn things. Um, and so what you'd want to do is divide it into multiple smaller applications. Maybe divide it at least by three or four and apply those as your liquids. Uh, but it's not hard to add it to compost. Um, in fact, I like to, when I'm making my compost piles and things, add these minerals to it. So if I take a soil test and build a compost, the compost is eventually going to end up on that soil. I add the elements to the compost that my soil needs. And it helps to digest them, gets them chelated in with organic compounds, and that's uh, really important because many of these things are, are um, can be harsh on soil life. Um, and so the more carbon that you can put out when you put them out, it buffers that effect. So you kill less microbes um, and it doesn't have the harsh effects that uh, you, people worry about. So, um, But basically, so I've talked a little bit about how to do the sulfur math. Uh, in terms of you take your target, you take how much you want. Uh, take, take your target, take where you are now and then do the math in terms of parts per million to pounds per acre, and then you figure it out. If you actually do that math on most of the trace elements, so you have 80 to 90 part, parts per million targets, say on manganese, you have 31, you get 60, let's say, um, parts per million deficient, you multiply by two to get pounds, you get 120 pounds of manganese. If you did all that at once, you would burn everything and give everything manganese toxicity. So, and all the trace elements especially have to take into consideration maximum yearly application rates. Those are on the resource on the resource page earlier. I, I pointed to a. Um, to it. Did I point to it? Um, here it is. So at these mineral on this page, tiny SEC mineral targets has uh, the maximum yearly application rates. Very important for the trace elements. So be, when you're doing your math. Have that sheet in front of you to make sure that you don't do anything you're not supposed to. Yeah. Yep. So um, the question is about time of year when you should add different minerals. Uh, 
the general rule is you should have them yesterday if you need them. <laughs> um, but there, there are some things that are better to do in the spring than some better in the fall. If it's a water-soluble element, you need to feed a crop. So in this example that I used before, you have a potassium, potential potassium deficiency issue that you might come up on that first one. If you're trying to grow tomatoes or something there especially. Um, if you do it in the fall, you're going to lose some of the leaching over the winter, potentially. Um, so you might want to do that one in the spring or during the growing season. If you're adding limestone, uh, you want to have that, the winter time helps to break it down. So anytime you're adding rock dust, rock powder type of material, uh, fall is a really good time. It gives that winter rest period um, when it helps to unlock those, the, the compounds from those materials. Um, and then anything that's leachable, water soluble, is best in the spring when you have a lot of biological activity that can chelate it or bind it up into organic molecules so it doesn't run away uh, and leave your leave your farm. So that would be like uh, boron, phosphates, uh, sulfates would be a springtime thing, sulfur, uh, limestone, uh, azomite, some of the rock powders would be fall. Everything else is sort of in the gray area, you can do either one, uh, but those are the, the general rules. So. Can you repeat that? So over? Is that information on the website? <laughs> um, no, but I'll simplify. So I'll simplify, I'll say it again. Um, rock dust that, that are not water-soluble plant foods, so limestone, um, sulfur that requires biological process to break down, things like that are best in the fall. But you can do it in the spring, but they're best to say in the fall. And anything that's water soluble, so those would be the things that are commonly thought of as fertilizers, so potassium sulfate, um, KMAG or sulfomag, um, any of the phosphate, the, the sulfate fertilizers, any of them really, they're going to leach more readily, so you want to apply them in the spring when you have a lot of biological activity to tie them up to make sure they don't run away. Yeah? Can you, like, say for sulfate? For sulfur, can you just throw it on your soil, or is it important to incorporate it? So uh, you do not have to incorporate. Uh, I certain if you're like if you're tilling just to incorporate minerals, um, I highly recommend you not do that. Uh, if you are going to till anyway, then it's nice to put the minerals down first because it is better to incorporate them. Uh, but if you have healthy soil life, they'll bring your they'll bring those minerals where they need to go quite quickly. Um, so. Yeah, it's not necessary for sure. How about if you have like a lot of organic matter? Yeah, so if you have a lot of organic matter, you can put it right on top. If your organic matter is something like, um, if it's something like leaves that where it might sort of concentrate some of those things, so if you, it hits the leaf and then it rolls and it all goes to one place where you're going to overdo the soil on a certain mineral, then sometimes that's less than ideal. Um, but most things you can put right on top without worrying. So just kind of look at how it, if you're spraying it by hand or whatever, look at an area, see how much it's concentrating in your particular type of mulch and see if it, you think it's going to be a problem. And if it is, you can always just put half as much down and then do the other half in the spring or at a later time um, to make sure you don't overdo it at one time. So, um, would you say azomite in the fall? I would, but I like, I mean, if I'm going to use, I might use a little bit in the fall and then a little bit again in the spring. Actually really like to do that when I can, if it's not adding a lot of extra work. Um, I do want to also mention that all of the recommendations on the website, they are in terms of granular materials. I really want to stress this. If you're using water soluble, you want to reduce your application rate. It's an important piece. Um, all right. So I didn't get through nearly as much as I wanted to. <laughs> um, this, I mean, there's so much to this, it's, it is it is overwhelming. Um, but I do want to just mention again, the, the thing you want to focus on is you look for the, the weakest link in your particular soil, so that's where you want to focus. Don't get super into getting your soil test perfect. Um, soil tests have a tendency of humbling you quite quickly. If you think you're doing everything perfect, you take your next soil test, and it's, it's like, what the heck just happened? Um, happens all the time. Generally, there is an explanation for it, uh, but it can be frustrating um, when you don't understand that explanation. But generally speaking, if it doesn't look like what you expected it to, 
just do the whole exercise again. What is now the weakest link and focus on that. Um, some things that get people tripped up is they put Lyme down the next year they test and they don't see anything improved and because they don't realize Lyme takes three years to break down. So if it takes three years and you're testing more frequently than that, it's quite likely you're going to see um, nothing or a very reduced influence of that. And so um, keep in mind what you've applied in the past and if use your intuition to some degree, make sure you're thinking about that um, and don't overdo it. So if you're testing every year and you're adding and you need limestone and you added limestone last year, don't add the same amount of lime again because you're probably you'll likely be overdoing your lime. When all of that becomes available in three years, you will have a new problem you've created. So um, take a slow and steady approach to it. Remember that we're not actually trying to get a perfect soil test. We're just trying to influence the soil structure and the biology and the system as a whole. Um, the, and, and here's where, I mean, so the biology trumps all this stuff every time. I mean, if you had perfect soil biology, like you could shred this and never look at it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Um, the key, though, is that I've not ever seen an example of really healthy, um, and I mean like perfectly efficient, like massively efficient systems where biology is working really well, where the underlying soil chemistry was really screwed up. I've never seen it. Um, Maybe other people have, but I would argue that even in that system, you think it's functioning really well in biology alone, add some minerals and see if it does even better. Um, because everything I've ever seen, um, when you work with the whole system holistically, look to try to figure out exactly all the places you can influence it, it always works better than just looking at one thing at a time. Um, so that's, that's a key thing I want to stress. Um, yeah, so I'd like to I open up the question because I don't have time to go to the next uh, section of material. Um, there's a lot of material in these slides. At the end, I talk about, I uh, have in here, every element, what it does for plants, how it works in the soil, just a really quick little slide on each one. Because then that, that helps. So if you understand what it's doing, then it can help, you can help to figure out what your plants might be lacking, what your soil might do. Um, so take a look at the slides once they're on the website. Will they be on the website? They will be on the website, yes, and hopefully soon. Um, and um, there's more slides in here. This uh, mentioned something real quick. So when you have uh, imbalances, you often will see them uh, show up in different ways. And so sometimes you'll see, um, you can find potassium deficiencies by looking at the leaves. You can see calcium deficiencies looking at the plants. And so you can actually figure out a lot of what you might need based on just looking at your field and getting good at observing differences and changes in your plants. Um, and sometimes you'll have plenty of, say, potassium on your soil test, but you've got plants that look and act just like potassium deficient plants. You see it actually all the time. Generally, it'll, it should tell you there's something else going on. Maybe you, uh, your irrigation system's not working right. There's not enough water, or there's some other issue at play. It happens all the time. And just real quick, does anyone know? Um, does anyone know what causes this? And what causes calcium? What causes calcium? Calcium. There we go. So, if you have calcium getting your plant in adequate amounts, you will never see this ever. Um, what is what is it? What causes this one? Does anyone know? Does that what your tomatoes look like, anyone? <laughs> um, that is potassium deficiency. It's pretty classic potassium deficiency. If you don't have enough potassium getting in your plants, you don't get uh, even ripening. And you may not you may even have examples where you get no ripening at all, uh, and it's really bad. Uh, and what about this one? Does anyone recognize this? So this one's commonly uh, uh, this was commonly called early blight. Some people may have had it on their plants in the past, and this and this are caused by the exact same thing. If you have adequate potassium in your plants, you will not get early blight. Your plants will die from frost at the end of the year with green leaves all the way from the ground all the way to the top. So um, these things, you know, so if you're seeing these things, you have a sign, a sign of so underlying problems. Uh, I would argue that you, there are a number of ways of addressing them. Uh, the BFA likes to talk about the soil, the minerals, the biology. Uh, one thing that I have found extremely helpful is uh, liquids, foliar, 
sprays, inoculants. These things are, by my way of thinking, like cheating. If you go out and you spray really good foliar amendments, um, plant shore from agrodynamics, foliate K, um, people out there talking, we have them in the mineral depot. You spray those once a week, tiny amounts, we're talking tiny, tiny amounts um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, they can keep you from having any of these problems. They keep your plants healthier. And then what I have seen is one of the best ways to build biology in your soil is you use the foliar sprays, you inoculate, and what happens is your plants stay at you know one percent more efficient or so at say photosynthesizing um, than the sun. And that one percent say they they need this much, and if they photosynthesize and they're photosynthesizing this much, so they're putting this much into the soil, and you're able to increase at one percent. More of that one percent increase is going to go into the soil. Um, so little tiny influences on photosynthetic efficiency can quickly double, triple, etc. the amount of carbon that your plant can put into the soil because it's creating now excess energy and that is what feeds soil life. That's what builds, bio builds um, healthy biologically active soils. And so anything you can do, in my book, anything you can do to keep plants a little bit healthy, whether that's soil minerals, whether that's foliars or anything else, is going to um, improve the biological function of that system. So that's the last thing I wanted to stress, I think. And so I will stay as long as people want to stay and ask questions. So. Yes. Can you talk about aluminum a little bit? Aluminum, yeah. It's always on the soil it's test. It's always on the soil test, yeah. <laughs> so aluminum is always on, uh, at least the Logan Lab soil tests and many others. Uh, the recommendations for aluminum, I don't know where they come from. They, I don't see 200, 250 parts per million. I almost never, or a maximum of 200, 250. I almost never see one in range. So I basically disregard the recommended range because as with literally all of these elements, the target amounts are basically just our best guess. And aluminum is one of those things that um, our best guess just isn't that good. Mm -hmm. So I don't worry too much. Um, basically, aluminum is a problem where you get tox aluminum toxicity, the main issue there. Um, aluminum is everywhere. It's the foundation of clay. Uh, clay is aluminum silicate, so it's in every like clay molecule. And so it's everywhere. And the only issue is when it becomes toxic. And the only way it becomes toxic is if you're massively deficient in, in your soil and other areas so that the plant is trying so desperately to get the nutrients it needs that it's making extremely harsh acids, dissolving aluminum, and sucking aluminum into the plant and causing aluminum toxicity. So if you have balanced soil, if you are, um, if you're even anywhere close on your soil test, I've uh, never seen aluminum toxicity. The only place I've seen it is where you have people growing blueberries, where they've been told the only way to grow good blueberries is to lower your pH, which, by the way, is not how you grow good blueberries, for anyone who wants to know. Um, and then they push it so low, they make it so imbalanced that aluminum toxicity starts to show up. So um, I don't really worry about it unless I'm working with a blueberry farmer who's adding sulfur. Is there a visible sign or symptom? There in is the that I don't know off the top of my head. I would Google that. There's a lot of resources um, online. Um, I mentioned in one of these slides, this one I believe, for um, looking at nutrient uh, impacts on plants. So how you can scout for a nutrient uh, deficiency or excess. Is that related to arsenic uptake also? Yeah, I mean, it's the, a similar thing applies. So. People are really worried about heavy metals, heavy metal toxicity in the soil, lead uptake by plants. My understanding is most like heavy metal uh, issues with produce is from physically splashing lead contaminated soil on your food. And very little is picked up by the plants. But everything I've read suggests that if your if your soil balance, the more balanced your soil, the less of those heavy metals are actually brought up into your plant tissue. And also, the more biology you have, the more of that gets chelated in such a way that's, that's not a problem. Yeah? You touched on this a couple times this morning, Elaine had mentioned um, when you're checking out mineral uh, changes, chemistry, soil changes, that the technique, um, so 
Mm -hmm. um, and the chemical. Yeah. 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 So, um, well, first of all, I recommend testing soil about every two years, every other year testing, or even every three, depending. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then, uh, so where, where, what other, that was, what else did you ask about? So, okay, so two things. One is this morning, she said that your soil chemistry is mm -hmm. really helpful for getting I'd say they're complementary. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, I think that uh, I don't. I try not to get very dogmatic about this, and it kind of bothers me when others do, um, because uh, we don't. It's not helpful to be dogmatic about this. So no, but no, but plenty of people do, and and I just want to. Uh, it's yeah, basically. Um, if you're thinking about it holistically, you're trying to make improvements. Um, uh, you, I don't know. Yeah. Like, did you approach that field also improving the microbial techniques? Yeah, okay, yes. Techniques? Absolutely. So, if you look at. No, no. So, I, this is what I've been saying. So, just doing the mineral approach does, is not the best way to do it. If, you're, if you need biology and minerals, you, you do both. Um, so this field, we could not have gotten this in three years with minerals alone. And I would argue, I don't know anyone to do it with biology alone either. Now, if someone can, please talk to me. Um, but people were trying to fix these fields with biology alone, and people were trying to fix it with minerals alone, and no one had as much success as when they put it together. So this field got the minerals it needed, so it got... Um, so this field in particular, it had a, it was like a TC exchange capacity of like 80 plus... So that's like pure clay, if people know that. Um, the sodium percent was 30, the magnesium was 30, and the calcium was 25. And so like, look at your thing, we have totally screwed up soil. And, that, and that's why nothing, literally nothing would grow. Um, and we probably could have added biology alone to that, but you add biology alone to that with something where you can't even get weeds to grow, the body just dies. There's nothing to feed it. So what we did was we, we broke every rule in the book, we applied like 2,000 pounds of elemental sulfur. We applied 10 tons per acre of gypsum. By the way, do not do this <laughs> unless you have this soil. Um, don't do that. <laughs> um, but it's exactly what this soil needed to jumpstart the system. Like you couldn't have jumpstarted a functional system here unless you did something that radical. Most of the time, you're not dealing with things that need radical change. You're dealing with things that need like tweaking. Um, but it works on when you have big problems. It works, and it works because you're addressing the, your big challenges, which then allows the whole system to work better. So what we did is uh, lots of gypsum. Luckily, gypsum was cheap in this area. We used lots of sulfur to help get rid of that extra sodium and the magnesium. We tried. We grew whatever the heck we could. Uh, we uh, added a whole bunch of humates and carbon sources and microbes, and not good microbes. And then this happens. Um, so, yeah, if it works together, it works really well. Yes? Uh, maybe I've got a soil that's somewhat similar. It's, it's over 7%, um, 7 pH, sorry. Okay. And um, I'm curious, so they recommended some of the micronutrients, zinc sulfate, uh, um, copper sulfate, because as the pH is going up, some of those micronutrients which are less available, mm -hmm. less elements of sulfur. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of any one particular one. I, I'm curious if uh, they were recommending smaller amounts just because that was, you can only add so much per year. And how much of an impact will that potentially have on my pH? So, smaller quantity? Not much. What's your, what's your exchange capacity? That's, so that's partially what determines how much material it takes to win from I mean, low teens. Low teens. So, I mean, I haven't seen the result, your test result, of course, but I would say um, if you're not adding elemental sulfur, 
you're not going to see your pH change dramatically. Um, if you're adding just some, a little bit of sulfate fertilizers, then it might change it marginally. Um, when you are adding those small amounts of those elements, um, you're, in many cases, they recommend them to, to, to the feed the crop model to get your crop healthy enough. Um, you can also use foliars in that case. So if, you're, if your soil is really high pH, a, a low statin is not really high. But if it is really high, you can use foliars because even you add it to the soil, it's not going to be available to the plants. So there's a lot of strategies that you can utilize in that example. But if you're, I mean, I don't know what low numbers you were given, like what, whether it was 30 oh, pounds, the, 3 pounds. Sulfur might have been like about 15 pounds. 15. Okay. Um, if you're, 15 pounds is basically nothing. If on a per acre basis for elemental sulfur. So, I mean, if you were already basically at 50 parts per million, or already at your target, or 75 even better, 15 is a good maintenance application to keep it there. Um, the sulfur is one of those critically important ones. And one thing that I'll, I'll mention is that um, sulfur, we used to, farmers used to get a lot of sulfur in their fertilizer when they used conventional uh, phosphate fertilizers. There was, all, there was gypsum mixed in, so they got calcium, sulfur, and phosphorus all together. And then they, we, they started moving to triple superphosphate because it was more efficient because they had always stripped out all the calcium and sulfur. It was just phosphorus. Great, great idea. Um, and then the other thing that happened in the last couple decades is um, the Clean Air Act uh, has re dramatically reduced the amount of sulfur in the atmosphere coming out of coal-fired power plants. And uh, far, we we're actually getting a reasonable dose of sulfur, sulfur fertilizer everywhere from acid rain. And now we're not getting it. And I would argue there's a lot of uh, soil systems that kind of got used to it and they were hooked on it. And now they're struggling because they're deficient. And the sulfur that was being rained on uh, for so long was also stripping out some of those other elements like calcium. So I think um, just thinking that we can just let nature take its course, we are, we've already screwed the pooch on that one. So um, we got to do something a little better than that. But, uh, yeah. Can you speak to uh, the use of um, sea salt? Yeah, um, so sea salt is great. Uh, basically, anything from the ocean is going to have a lot of uh, trace elements, a lot of like micro trace elements. So we only looked at a couple of elements here on the soil uh, form, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest at least 42, maybe 46 elements are necessary for enzyme pathways that have been identified. There are 92 naturally occurring elements and there's probably an enzyme pathway that needs every single one, uranium included. Um, just hasn't been discovered yet. I seriously bet money on that. Um, and what that means is if you can get those in there in tiny trace amounts, you might be actually um, increasing your the, your the efficiency of your system. Um, salt water is going to have most, if not all, of those naturally occurring elements in it. So you're going to get those tiny trace amounts, which is really all you need if you don't have them. Um, if you have too much sodium, you definitely want to avoid the sodium, uh, the, the sea salts that don't have the sodium removed. There are some processes you can use to actually remove most of the sodium from seawater and still keep the trace elements. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's great. I like that. Uh, azomite has a lot of trace elements. Um, that's why we often recommend like basalt rock dust or any rock dust, really, because there's a lot of those trace elements. Um, well, that I don't think I mentioned was that we're talking about uh, biological diversity, but one thing that uh, spurs biological diversity is diversity of uh, things in the soil, parent materials. So a diverse diversity of minerals in your soil will actually spur a diversity of biology because different types of biology are, are better or worse at digesting different things in your soil. So um, I mean, there's, there are microbes that eat you know, sulfur, uh, sulfur uh, um, Sulfur vents under the ocean. There's like the microbes that literally live off of that, and so it's uh, when we add sulfur, we're probably keeping entire new species of life alive in our soil and giving them conditions to thrive. So, anytime you're going to add diverse sources of things, I like to do it. Yeah. Just back to your question about test frequency once every two years. Um, I've always had to steer away from doing mineral testing, chemical testing, because of the very inherent variability in the sample. Process. Yeah. Yep. And then, so I love your comments on that. Plus, seasonality impacts. Yep. Of the, yep. the window, or, or do you, or, or, or does it? 
somehow wash out so you don't matter. <laughs> Excuse me. So the way I recommend so the question about <coughs> the variability in the testing itself and the procedures, what I like to say is basically um, when you test, try to do it the same way because you're really going to compare, you want to compare yourself over time to your same, you have to start somewhere, but then you want to kind of do an apples to apples comparison, do the same time of year, um, do it in the same way. Um, you always want to make sure you take your samples from multiple places in a field, so you want to try to get a representative sample. The best way is to figure out this, I want to test this area, so basically try to do random tests. Don't like let your biases influence where you go, or you might find that you go to the places that are the best, if you're like, I just ate a really good carrot from here, or the worst, where you're, because you're thinking like, man, this is not a good field, so you're going to go to the worst, and then you're going to, you know, it'll, but you can bias your soil sample with how you take your test. And so try to do randomly, try to do at least 7 to 12-ish, that's a good range for the number of cores that go into a bag. The other thing you want to do is many people take it, put it into a bucket, mix it up, take a sample, put it in a bag, and chip it. Not the best way to do it because soil is not homogenous, does not break up the same way. So when you mix it, you're not actually mixing and making it homogenous, usually, unless you're really dedicated and diligent about it. And so what? that's why soil probes are really nice. They don't have to cost a lot. Um, you can get them, I think, for as little as $15, $20, or you can pay $120. Um, but basically, anything that takes a core sample, uh, push the whole sample right into the bag. Don't mix it. The lab will mix it when they get it. They got the equipment to do it and homogenize it. Um, it that's the best way. You also avoid a potential route for contamination, which would be your bucket. Um, I've seen soil tests come back where I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, where did you put your sample? And they're like, I put it in the bucket. And I said, what did you use the bucket for last fall? And they're like, well, I, used, I planted some bulbs, and so, uh, oh, oh bone meal and limestone. Okay, there you go. Just a little bit that's left over is enough to contaminate a sample. So um, if you can eliminate those sources of contamination and think about that when you're doing it. So um, does that answer the question? Yeah, and seasonality. And seasonality. Um, Spring or best, fall, like yeah, best time was, So best time to uh, test the take soil tests uh, was yesterday. Um, if yesterday isn't an option, then tomorrow. And uh, Fall, I like if you want to know um, the worst, your worst case scenario. Spring is best if you want to know your best case scenario, assuming you live in a place that has winters. And that's because uh, soil rests over, over the winter time and things become more available, generally speaking. So your numbers in spring will generally be higher than your numbers in fall. And so whenever you're taking soil tests, kind of think about what, what are the questions you're trying to answer and the results you're trying to get because um, that will help you to figure out, should I do it now or should I do spring? Um, and it might change depending on whether it's an existing field or a new field. Or There's lots of, lots of nuances to that. Mm -hmm. There's no simple answer, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll stay as long as you want to stay, but it is um, the closing remarks happen in three minutes. Yeah. We'll see you on other questions. I'll stay. I'll stay. I mean, it totally works. I think about it. Same with Brexit. It's very similar. You can read the W. You need water. You've got to be